I can start by talking a okay. little about myself because then you give you time to do that because you okay. know everybody talks about themselves so go ahead so I am a grants person and I always have been I've certainly done some typical fundraising as you all think about it in terms of you know individual donors and major donors and events and that galas and that kind of thing but for over 40 years, my whole background has really been in grants. And so in that, I worked, I did primarily my grants work for social services, youth and family services organizations. But I've trained, I became a trainer for the Grantsmanship Center, which is uh, in Los Angeles for, uh, I've been a trainer with them for 20 years. And I've trained people all over the country, this United States, and in other countries. I'm uh, gonna, I'm starting to do some outreach into Canada and webinars in Canada and that sort of thing. But I've trained in Ukraine and Ireland and uh, Puerto Rico and so forth. Um, I've reviewed. I've been a grants reviewer for the U.S. federal government. I've written two books. One is a how-to book about how to write grant proposals. The other is you have a hammer. Uh, building grant proposals for social change. And that's what I want to talk about today. So my grants background is so, oh, oh, I write regularly for the nonprofit Times. I've written tons of articles for publication. So I don't know, just anything to do with grants, I've pretty much done it. Um, and right now I've retired from the Grantsmanship Center. I was head of all of their curriculum development and training and training their trainers to train. And now I am just doing my own consulting work and writing and so forth. And so that's where I am. But uh, Sandra got in touch with me originally related to my new book, You Have a Hammer. And I wanted to tell you a little bit first about why I wrote it. After having trained thousands of people, and, and I'm not exaggerating, over the last 20 years, I saw some really common misperceptions and mistakes that limit the change making power of grants work. So I, I started, it's just a little book, this, this book of mine, Hammer, I call it. I started just collecting those misperceptions and writing little snippets about how you needed to rethink it or reframe your thinking about this work in terms of some of these issues that I see. And that became the book. And so the point of it is that I'm hoping that people who are either currently involved in grant work, grants work, will make sure they're thinking about the work right before they're, you know, go and do more grants work. And for people just getting into the field, I'm really hoping that you'll maybe read the book and, and think about the issues I raised before you start seeking grant funding. So one of the first issues I find in most organizations is that grants work, the person who writes the grant proposals and so forth, they're usually like the stepchild within the fund development or um, of the organization. So you'll have people who are doing major donors or major events or annual giving and so forth. And they're all talking and collaborating and working with the ED and the board and off to the side somewhere is a grants person. And a lot of time that grants person is given instructions that just say, go get some grant money instead of um, having those instructions be really thoughtful to be integrated into the strategic plan, thoughtful in terms of what is the best use for grants money. Um, I want to promote that, that change because there's a perception that within the field of philanthropy, that individual giving greatly is greatly higher, is a lot more money than grants. But I'm going to challenge that because that statistic that you see constantly, at least in the States, and I think you see it some in Canada as well, does not include government grants. And government grants have traditionally been offered for the common good, to support the common good. I mean, here in the States, and I know in Canada as well, the, the governments, especially the provincial governments in Canada, do funding for 
uh, youth and family services, environment, food insecurity, I mean, you name it. And so even though you may not be able to define that money as philanthropic in that an individual did not say, let me give you this. A lot of times that money is public money, obviously, because it comes through public sources via taxation or fees and levies or however. So if you add in government money, grants are actually a lot more than what you get the money available through individual giving. Now that said, we all have to recognize that individual giving is flexible and growable. You know, you can target it to what you need when you need it. Whereas grant funding is generally restricted to certain purposes, you know, unless you go to a very, uh, a foundation that has sort of an open door in terms of what it's willing to fund or a corporation. But grant funding is generally short term, is generally uh, targeted to a specific issue area. It's not as, uh, it is not as flexible or growable as individual giving. So what really needs to happen if we want to use our grant funding to make change is we need to, first of all, elevate the grant acquisition function within our organizations up so that it is integrated fully into the fund development um, function of the organization so that it interacts with strategic planning, with budget planning, so that all these junctures where you're looking at what money do we need in order to pursue our mission, you're, you're, you're getting all of these different perspectives at the table and saying within this context, what is a good role for grants funding? So then when you do that, you, you'll come away uh, with grants having a very specific function towards per, per, propelling the mission forward, towards uh, you know, achieving the strategic plan or, or so forth. So, so first of all, one of the things that really limits the change making power of grants is when you put that function within your organization off in a corner, because I guarantee you lots of people who write proposals, their instructions from their supervisors or EDs are go get money. I mean, that's kind of it. You need some money, you need some grants, go find some money. We don't have enough money, go get some grants. So that limits the change making power of grants and it, it limits the rightful role that a grants professional should play within the organization. So that's a big one. And I see some of you kind of nodding your head. At least I can see three of you here. So, I mean, I think this is resonating. This, this is the case. I mean, I used to say that, you know, when I was doing heavy duty grants work, like sometimes two federal proposals at once. I mean, I might have on a shirt that was held together with a safety pin while somebody else is in heels going off to the gala, you know, and it, it's sort of like this dichotomy of, of respect for the different fund development functions. And I'd like to see those integrated. Um, another thing that's a huge problem with the thousands of people I've trained is that people don't tend to truly understand what a grant request is and what a grant award is. Because if I said to you, what is a grant request? Everybody go, well, that's really silly. I know you fill out an application, you answer some questions and you're asking for money. That's a grants request. But what I say to you is that it's actually a lot more than that. If you base your grant request and on community need and let community need drive what it is that you seek money for, then it's much more than a, just a request for money. What it is, it it's really is a kind of advocacy because you know, very seldom will you find you ever put out a grant request where you're the only one involved. Usually you've got some other volunteers involved or other organizations involved somehow. So you're all coming together to advocate for something to happen in your community. Now that, that something 
could be that you're going to try to mitigate a problem. It could be that you're going to try to see some opportunity that the that the needs to happen in the community to elevate the quality of life. But whatever it is, you are coming together, and your grant proposal is saying this thing needs to change. And so your proposal is actually an argument for change because there's no grant proposal you will ever write that is not an argument for change. So example, you could say, well, Barbara, what about general operating support? Well, if your organization is pursuing its mission effectively, you are probably got some outcome data that shows you are making a difference. If you are making a difference, that means you're producing positive change. And then if you're asking for ongoing operating support, you're saying, please help us keep this change going. This change matters. So an operating proposal is not, please support the jobs at my organization. Please help me get keep the doors open. The operating proposal is actually an argument that says, please help us keep this important change going, help us sustain this change. So a proposal is also, um, it, it's also a proposal for partnership because every funder you're ever gonna reach out to wants to accomplish certain things. And so you're saying to the funder, boy, have I got something that we could work on together be a partner with me in accomplishing this change. So it's, it's a financial plan, it's a legal agreement, but mostly it's advocacy, a request for partnership, and the money is involved in the transaction, absolutely. But if you let the money be the purpose of the transaction, you are losing the power of that tool to, to make the change that you want to make. And I keep using the word change because if you are involved in any sort of organization, whether it's environmental, social services, health, uh, food, animal welfare, whatever it is, those are the, that is the issue. Whatever issue you're concerned about, that's the deal. The money is the tool, a means to an end. The end is always the outcome. So if you go into grants work thinking grants are to get money, you're going to lose a lot of the power of the work and you're not going to get as much money. I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand. So in other words, it's not some pie in the sky sort of uh, high philosophy here. If you do this work in this way, you're going to be more attractive to funders because you're not running out chasing the money. You are, in fact, running out chasing the public good in, in some way, in whatever variety of way you, you happen to be pursuing it. And, and so, and likewise, a grant award is money, right? But it's not what it's about. Basically, it's an investment. The funder's saying, we, whether we're a government agency, a corporation, or a foundation, we have a certain amount of money that we're going to use to accomplish certain things we've defined. And so um, we're going to invest this money in this organization because they, they seem as though they're really going to be able to make this change. So it's a social investment. It's where they, they parse out their money to get things to happen. So it's a way, the money is just a way that they pursue their own mission by investing in your mission. So obviously you got to, you know, apply for things that really match up with your mission. That's one of the premier understandings of, of being able to do grants work. So when a funder gives you money, they're basically betting on you. I mean, they're betting that you can do what it is you said you would do in that grant proposal. So it, it's a number of, of things and it's not just about the money. Um, so one of the, once you come at it from understanding, you know, take a role within your organization if you're doing grants work to advocate that you're at that planning table. That if somebody says, go get the money, you say, 
for what purpose, you know, what's our, so forth. Um, another real problem is definition of why you're seeking grant funding. I mean, every, every funder is going to say to you, why do you want a grant? And I'll tell you, people call me and they say, Barbara, have you got a few minutes to tell me how to get grants? And I go, oh no, this is not going to go well. Um, and I say, okay, why do you need grants? Because we need money. What do you need the money for? We just need it because we don't have enough of it. You know, that, that's a lot of the discussion you hear. But in almost every grant proposal you are ever write, the question is, why do you need the money? Now, they may call it, what's the problem? What's the need? What's the situation? Whatever they call it, don't get hung up on their terminology. They're asking you, what is propelling you? What is compelling you to make this grant request? So I define that as, I call it the problem. But I know it may be an opportunity. I just call it the problem because you got to have one word to use. But I, I call a problem something that causes harm, threatens harm, is less than ideal, or is an opportunity to be seen. So it's the whole spectrum. And so you have to look out into the community and say what needs to happen. So an example of being driven by what you see needs to happen in the community, as opposed to running out and trying to just get money, is, for example, I'm going to give you an example in my own life about a transitional living program for young men who are returning to the community from jail. So I was driving home one night. And I heard on the radio that something like one in five young men in this certain community under the ages of under age of 21 was involved with the, with the justice system. And uh, was in jail and coming back to the community on probation. And I thought, this is just not right. Something's got to change. So then I learned that there was nothing to support these young people coming back into the community. So it became a revolving door. You all probably know of this, this issue in your own communities. So it took probably four years of planning without any money to do planning, just kind of fitting it in and talking to people and pulling people together and having meetings. And after four years, we were ready to put in a proposal for a planning grant. And after we got the planning grant, which escalated our ability to work on this, finally, in year five, we were ready to put in a proposal for a startup grant to get some transitional living pro, um, services into the community for these young people. So we didn't say, oh, there's a grant opportunity. What can we do with it? We said, there's a problem. How are we going to solve it? Where do grants fit? Where do partnerships with other organizations fit? Where do individual donations fit? So it, it becomes a very integrated thing. So in, in that situation, the problem was that young people who were in the justice system in jail and who came back from jail uh, typically went back to jail again, violated uh, parole, went back to jail again, their life fell apart. It mattered because it, it had a very high cost to society and a tremendous, horrible cost to the individuals themselves. And why was it happening? It was happening because there, weren't, there were no supports at all. The young people were coming back into the same situation they left without any support. So with every problem that you define, you have to be able to say, here's a situation that concerns me. Here is why it matters and here's why it's happening. Unfortunately, the typical argument would be to the funder, the problem is there's not a transitional living home for young men coming out of jail. So in other words, typically, uh, proposal writers say that the problem is the lack of the program they want to implement. And that sets up a very circular argument. It does, if you were to say to me, the problem is that there is no transitional living program for young men coming out of jail, I would say to you, 
why do you think you need one? Are there, are there, are there young men coming out of jail? Yes. How many? Is, are they getting in trouble? Yes, they are. Why does that matter? In other words, so let's, let's play that out a little. Here's a really hard one, but it, it's a true one. Here in the States, I don't know about Canada, there's not enough affordable housing. And that results in a lot of problems. But if you were to tell me, if I was a funder and you were to tell me, the problem is there's not enough affordable housing, I wouldn't accept that. I'd say to you, what makes you think that? What is it in your community? What's the situation in your community that indicates to you that there is a lack of affordable housing and that that matters? So in other words, I'd want to hear about families paying more than X percent of their income for rent, uh, families who were housed in unsafe, unsanitary situations, who were homeless, people who were homeless, because, you know, some sort of indication of how affordable, the lack of affordable housing played into that. So the lack of affordable housing, the lack of it, the lack of whatever program it is you wish to implement could certainly be one of the causes or the cause of a problem, but it's not the problem itself. So if you say the problems, there's not a tutoring program in our high school, then I would say, are, why do you think that's a problem? Are there people who need to be tutored? Why do you know that? So one of the really big problems is setting up this nonsensical argument where you say, this is typical. The problem is there's not a teen center in our community. So what we'll do is we will establish a teen center and we'll measure the outcome to say how many teens are going to the teen center. Well, why does that even matter? Why do you think you need a teen center? What situation in your community is that method responding to. So think for a minute about the different arguments that you make when you're writing a grant proposal. And if you hear yourself saying the problem, what is motivating me to submit this pr proposal is that there is a lack of this or that program, then jump back and ask yourself, why do I think that? What are the indicators in my service area, in my community, among my population that are telling me that this program I want to implement is important? And, and we can talk more about that, certainly, if you um, want to. I want to, I'm just looking at a few notes here. I want to go on to what I think is another problem. But, but the notion there, just to summarize, is you can't, in terms of making change, you can't propose a logical argument for change, which is what a grant proposal is, unless you know what the problem is, what it is you're trying to change. So you got to go all the way back to why do I think we need this program? Now, when it comes to grants, everybody's very familiar with the word collaboration. And funders often require collaboration. But one thing that really limits the change-making power of grants is not accepting as an organization the imperative of collaboration. So collaboration, don't do it because the funder wants to see it. Yeah, the funder may want to see it, but that's not the reason to do it. We exist within an ecosystem. Every service that you want to provide or thing that you do in the community or in your service area exists within an ecosystem. And so there are really some overlaps, like uh, a lot of organizations or groups out there working, their interests and missions are going to overlap with your interests and missions. And so you can't be nearly as successful in making change happen unless you interact with them and you all look at the same, you, you, you narrow down to where you all intersect and say, how can we work on this together? So obviously a couple of real obvious examples, one would be um, homelessness. So 
why, why is there homelessness? What are the causes? Well, a lot of people are concerned about it. Well, let's see, drug addiction, mental health problems, uh, domestic violence, um, lack of affordable housing. Um, I mean, there's more. I can't think of them all. There's just a lot. And so no one organization does all of that. So if you are uh, concerned about homelessness, you've got to be involved with all those other groups that are working on it through the drug abuse angle, through the mental health angle, through the housing angle. Because if you're not, you're not going to be as effective. And the problem you're all concerned about, that little center where you all connect, is not really going to get effectively addressed. I was training in Montana and there was a man in my class who was from a state agency. And he was very concerned because there was an evasive weed that was just taking over parts of the state. And, and if, if animals would walk through the weed, you know, the seeds would get on their fur or people would walk through this weeds, the seeds would get on their pants. And so it was spreading very easily. So he wanted to write a grant proposal. He was there because he was concerned about the weed and its effect on the uh, ecology of the area. And it also had an economic impact. So he wanted to get funding to contain the weed. And so the very first question I asked him is, does that weed stop at the state line? And he said, no. So let me just ask you, if you're really talking about making change, and you want to get rid of this weed, even if you are and you step over the state line and it's not been eradicated, what good is that going to do? So what I said to him, if you're serious about making change, you've got to reach out to the other states, get the area affected by this weed, bring it all together and go for a proposal together for a coordinated approach to eradicate the weed. That, that's a very clear example but try to apply that thinking to what it is you do in your community. Uh, I'm talking about radical um, collaboration. Now, I've been involved with establishing two statewide um, collaborations. What are they called? You know, uh, it, it, the word is escaping me. Coalitions. Uh, one for runaway and homeless youth and one for teen centers. And the notion was this, there was a lot of rural, little groups out there, very rural communities, and none of them sort of had the power to do really effective proposal writing to bring in grant money on their own. So we designated a lead agency, brought all these groups together in a coalition, which was not easy because you have to decide who's going to do what and how you divide up money and how you decide if you're doing what you said you're going to do. So there's lots of stuff. But then you bring in money as a group and sub-grant out. So a lot of times you, you do that. I did it at a state level. You can do it at a community level. Collaborative proposal writing really acknowledges the ecosystem within which your organization exists. So I think you're, you're getting the point that as I, I talk about all this, this is a not about how do you write a measurable outcome? How do you develop that? You know, how do you clearly define your methods? How do you prove the point? How do you use data? All of that you got to know, but that's how to write a proposal. This is if you, this is seriously, if you want to make change, if, if that's what you're into it for, then step away from business as usual. And, and at every juncture, ask yourself, what's the most impactful way that we can go about this, this work of, of grant proposal development? So, um, yeah, I see that. And if you do have questions, just, or even comments, like I had um, one woman I was talking to, she said, but Barbara, we're such a small organization, we can't really go for federal grants or big grants. And I said, yeah, but you can be a part of a coalition that does go for that as long as you're involved with others in your community who are concerned about this same issue that you're concerned about. So um, it's sort of a radical 
it has to do with sharing. Um, you sh when you get together in these sorts of shared proposals, you share both risk and opportunity. You, sh you share benefit, you share money and to make it work, every group has to feel it has more to gain than it has to lose. So it knows that it's going to have more power or it doesn't have as good a chance to do the work or to get the funding unless they come together. And there has to be a lot of discussion and negotiation. So it, it's not an easy thing, but it's a powerful thing because once you build it, it's there. And so when something shows up that needs to happen, you, you call your budge, you know, on the phone or, you know, text or whatever you do. And all of a sudden they're going, well, yeah, we could do this part and we could do that part. Okay, let's get together. And you, you start trusting each other and sharing both resources and impact making. So, so that's, that's a big one. Um, so the next time you hear collaboration, don't think of it as a trite word expand your thought about how it can be, how it can affect your ecosystem. I guess the, the last thing I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, and then I do want to open it up to see if I can get some comments, um, is just that a grant proposal is ne should never be about your organization. It should be about your cause, those you serve, the issue. Now, even a general operating proposal is not, as I said, please give us money to keep the doors open. Please help us keep staff employed because you know what? You don't exist to employ staff. I mean, I'm glad you do. I'm glad people have jobs, but that's not why you exist. So you, whatever you exist is the reason for a proposal. So general operating is to keep doing good work. Let's say that you want to put in a capacity building proposal, which what that means to funders is to strengthen your internal systems so that you can do even better work or to support your work. It's not like let's do another program. That's a program kind of grant. So let's say you need to improve your data system, your IT. Um, your argument is not please help us get good IT for our system, for our, for our organization, because our T, IT, our network and whatever is old. And it, you always have to frame it within why that matters to the work, to the beneficiary. So obviously if you have really bad technology, you're gonna be less efficient. You're gonna spend more time than you need to in that realm instead of doing other kinds of work. You may not be able to collect and analyze data the way you need to, to guide your work, to help you do continuous quality improvement. I, I, actually, this is a true story. I had one group who uh, was keeping their bookkeeping, their billing for their pretty large substance abuse treatment program it, on, on note cards, you know, and it was just, you know, I couldn't believe it. But it wasn't, please, please don't let us have to keep, keep doing this on note cards. First of all, they'd be shooting themselves in the foot because it would, it would ding their credibility, right? But it would really be that we need to be efficient in recovering all of the costs we can so we can strengthen our services, deliver services we need to, make sure there aren't waiting lists. I mean, all kinds of reasons that all have to do with the beneficiary. I mean, obviously, if you, if you build a new building, or do a big renovation, uh, you're, you're not going to say our new building is going to mean that less that more people stop using drugs. I mean, that's kind of a silly argument. But but you can frame it to why does it matter? Is is your current building inadequate to offer facilities for for the proper counseling and treatment? Does it not accommodate the children who come along with the parents? I mean, there's lots of different reasons, but the reasons you need to do whatever you need to do is not because of your organization, it's because of those you serve. So there's a lot more, I don't even call them chapters, I call them little sections in the book that identify these sorts of ways I want you to try to think about grants work. Um, for example, there's one about um, 
a grant is not the solution to every funding need. Just because you need money does not necessarily mean you need a grant. So think about that. You know, this is, and I give some examples of, of that or uh, work to sustain um, work to sustain impact, not activities or programs. The only reason the activity or program exists is because of the impact. So uh, those are just some examples of the chapter. So let me open it up um, and I hope people will ask some questions or make some comments or maybe give some examples of your perception of what I've been talking about. I'm going to call on you, Sandra, if no one else does. Yeah, I'm waiting to see if anyone's got something. No? <laughs> I do. Okay, okay great. Allison. So, I'm Allison Doty. Uh, we are Glide Revitalization, and we are the long-term recovery group for the Archie Creek Fire in Glide, Oregon. Um, so a lot of our funding is um, pretty relevant specifically to our disaster. Um, and, uh, but as we look at um, our primary uh, mission is for the betterment of Glide. And what that included was, you know, beautification projects, economic development, um, housing, and not so much in social services. And so as we're moving forward, um, we are going to be writing a block grant, um, a community development block grant. And uh, there are a lot of studies that haven't been done yet for this grant. If I wanted to go after money for those studies, um, how would I, uh, you talked about wording, you know, um, to help us keep doing good work, not right. necessarily um, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm just kind of a little bit confused on what's maybe what's a like in our initial um, letter of interest, right? Uh, how we would state that. Now, are you going to be asking for those studies through the community development block grant? Is that what the application is going to be for? Or are you going to try to get those studies done in order to apply for the community development block second, grant? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, can you do this? Do those time frames correspond? I mean, do you have time to put in a proposal, get the money, do the studies before the block grant is due, or are you heading for the next cycle? Um, we're, we have time. Okay. Um, a planning grant, what we're really talking about is a planning grant, because okay. a study is like what you're going to know from the study is what you need to do. Is that correct? Right. So, so I, I would define that as a planning grant and, and do question me if you don't agree, but that's how I think about that. And okay. so with, with a planning grant, your argument is pretty much the same. So why, what's the situation that concerned you? Well, um, you've had a disaster and as a result, there are uh, various specific challenges in your community that you will mention. Right. And then it matters a lot because it's affecting quality of life, economic right. viability, uh, health of uh, children and families and everybody, you know, uh, right. it matters for those reasons. Okay. Um, why is it happening? It's happening. The disaster caused it. But the issue right now is that we need to move forward and we need to figure out the prioritization of the different activities, specifically what will best propel us out of this situation and the priorities uh, that we need to place on those different activities, assuming you might not be able to do them all at once. Right. So um, a, with a planning grant, what you're gonna propose as an outcome is going to be a well-researched, accepted by the community, best practices, plan of action. Your methods are going to be actually whatever you have to do to get that, you know, get that done, that study or that plan. I'm, I'm thinking of it as a plan of action because if you had a really good plan, then you take that out into the community development block grant arena or right. any other funding arena 
and you say, look, we, we know what we need and what order we need it and why it's best practice to do this and why this is the best way to get out of it, then people will fund it, you know? Okay. So what you're going for is a planning grant. The problem's the same. Why it right. matters is the same. But you're saying uh, in terms of why it's happening right now, we're kind of at a standstill because we need a real well develop plan to move forward effectively and we can we don't want to run helter skelter just grabbing at whatever happens to be there we want to do it in a cohesive way outcome is the plan now obviously even though you're going to have the plan you do want to talk to the the vision the goal is that through that plan you're going to move forward methodically over x year period hopefully to recover right. and even strengthen your situation in the community. Is, is that helpful? That was very helpful. Okay. I have a, and then one other question is, um, so we just got a state contract, um, which is gonna cover 90% um, of our uh, employees. Um, I have, I've been asked to apply for another capacity building grant. What other things, in capacity realm uh, would be a good ask. So you're gonna, so that's good. So it sounds like you have a funder who will listen to you in terms of needing that plan. It sounds like right. well, that plan is definitely a capacity building thing, it's huge. Well, I would just say, do you have, um, do you have data systems already in place? Cause you're gonna need it, you know, in terms of right. IT evaluation, you need, one big thing is always gonna be to be able to document what you're doing. We call them sometimes mm -hmm. outputs, the number of different things you're doing, how much of what, when, where. Okay. But the other thing is the difference that that's making. And so you'll end up, if in your plan to move forward, um, I don't know if you'll get that far, but somehow you do need to develop and identify indicators of what, yeah. what, what are your benchmarks? What's gonna to indicate to you that you've moved forward in this way and that way and the other way? Some people yeah. call those benchmarks. Some people call them short-term or intermediate outcomes. You can call them one thing or the other, but mm -hmm. uh, you need to develop a, sort of a trajectory of where you are going and what indicators will show that you're moving in the right direction and then have a data system that you, uh, so I would say capacity building is going to be uh, setting up a data measures and evaluation and then having a, a system that is easy to use so that you don't spend your whole life trying to wrangle it, you know? Exactly. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. I need to excuse myself. I've got to hop on to another, another Zoom. But thank you. I appreciate your time. I'm glad you came. Let me know if you, you email me if you need me. Okay, I've got it. Thank and buy you. my book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look for it. Thank you. Okay. All right. I put the link in the chat as well. Thank All you, right, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Um, we have a couple minutes left. Does anyone else have any questions? Barbara, anything interesting? I see. I also need to go. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Marie. I'm, I'm glad you were here. Actually, I did have a question. Um, Great. I guess it was about the soul. This is kind of the long-term recovery. And a lot of what you talked about was sort of collaborating with larger communities and really looking at the root of problems and how right. to address them. And so I was thinking about um, sort of strategies you've encountered for how to evaluate, you know, balancing sort of short, long-term, you know, when you're thinking about grants to go for and um, the real needs of a given community. Sometimes it involved, as you mentioned, one of your examples, you know, it was like a four year process of the planning. And then in the last year, the year five was when you could really, after having gotten the planning grant, then you knew what you needed to know to get the bigger grant for the actual programs that were um, seen as necessary. So I guess I'm, my question in a certain sense is the general strategy that um, you think of when you're trying to evaluate how to know how long term thinking should be. Well, you know, that really is a hard question. You know, yeah. when I did that work in with in the community for the transitional living home, yeah. I mean, I knew it was going to be a heavy lift because there's a lot of not in my backyard. These are hard kids, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so 
if I could have snapped my fingers, I would have said it needs to happen right this minute because it did. You know, there are lots of kids who did not have the advantage of it over those four or five years. But reality was that I knew it couldn't because I knew it wouldn't happen in the community in that given time. And so even though I knew it needed to happen quicker and and because the reality is all of us have uh, full-time jobs or something that we're doing that's taking up a lot of our time. The only thing I could do was squeeze it in here, squeeze it in there, do absolutely the most I could. Like, who should I talk to? Who should I call? Who should we involve? What many should we have? As much as I could. And then over time, it sort of became clear. Now, in that instance, for that particular issue, I didn't lay out a, 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 a clear plan until we got the planning grant. I mm-hmm. just started bringing the issue to the community and pulling the community together, including all the players who I knew would be interested. Of course, jobs people, employment people, probation, education, police, the faith-based community. All of, there was a um, reparative justice group. I mean, all of those people had to be involved. So it, it depends on the situation. The situation that Allison was just talking about you know, she's in a situation that's bad and that they have a lot of need. I wish they didn't. Those fires were horrible. But but it's good in that she's got an agency that's going to try to give them the capacity and so forth and help them get where they need to be and she'll be able to lay it out and have a time frame. I think a lot of times when you're doing deep community work, uh, you don't have that advantage. Like Allison's is like something burned down. I mean, how overt as that but you know with you let's say that you were dealing with substance abuse or homelessness or all these intractable seeming problems that are deep and rooted and tang the roots are all tangled up and everything and they're in your community and all communities it that's going to be in a way there's some a, a place where there's a development of will a development of mutual will amongst all those that have intersecting interests as organizations or even individuals. I mean, I don't know if I'm answering. I, I guess I'm saying it depends. Yeah. Does any of that make sense? Well, no, yeah, because it, it makes sense that, you know, you really have to pull the community kind of toward itself and enable a lot of communication to happen in order to know if there's any kind of short term fix or if this really is some, you know, naughty problem that is going to require a long-term thing and that's going to be hard because you want to fix it right away but of course you know the community can't just do that it has to communicate with itself and figure out a plan and then get a planning grant and then so on and so forth so yeah you you could as a group it's possible like here in in the little town i live in montpelier vermont burnland just outside of montpelier um we had an issue where homeless folks didn't have any place to go in the winter and so a short-term fix was a couple of churches opened their basement and started doing things like that. Now, it wasn't a long-term fix. Community needed to do better. It put together a planning committee and so forth. But when you do come together, it is possible to, you know, seek funding for short-term fixes if those fixes will have enough of an impact to alleviate pain and suffering or, or seize an opportunity that's once in a lifetime or fleeting. So you you can ask for, for short-term things as long as you l- place the ask within a context of a longer look at the whole thing. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we're about out of time, Sandra. Yeah, and I think most people have dropped off. I think there's one other person on here, but assuming there's no other questions, um, we'll, we'll probably wrap it up there. That was really insightful. I found it very interesting. I, I work with a smaller nonprofit, so we haven't really done much with grants, but it was really interesting to learn um, about all the things you said. And um, it's in a way similar to some of the projects I've worked on. And, you know, you kind of need to get to the root of, of the ask, right? And, and the why. Uh, yes. It's usually about the why. So that was uh, really insightful for me. And I... I guess we'll wrap it up and thank you so much for for your time today, Barbara. That was excellent. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for having me and thank you for posting the link to my book. Thanks a lot. Okay. (laughs) Bye-bye everybody. Bye everybody. Thanks Barbara. Bye.